Ladies and gentlemen, I just want you to know that I think you are all lying to yourselves. Yes, it's absolutely true. Whether you believe it or not, as much as you want to learn and diligently study the game of chess, what you truly prefer is watching absolute disasters unfold on the chessboard in front of you and witnessing it as a spectator. It's no surprise that my series Guess the Elo and How to Lose at Chess have more views than any other by far. Now, as much as we want to learn and get better at this wonderful game, we really want to witness chaos, and this video does not disappoint. Every single time I think I've outdone myself in terms of content of bad games, a new one drops itself on a plate in front of me, and it's getting a little bit difficult curating uh, games because obviously we need to make them entertaining, but we also actually kind of want to learn from them, like let's be honest. So this game uh, was a roller coaster ride. The eval bar went up and down. There were many, 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 many swings. And uh, I'm going to take you through the game, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, the players are obviously edited. Uh, they are 800, so it's already shocking. It's a rapid game, which means 10 minute. Uh, White begins the game with e4. Uh, and, and obviously, they both have honorary grandmaster titles. Uh, Black plays e5, and White plays f3. Now, f3 is the fourth worst move on the board at present, which is pretty nuts, considering there are many moves. Um, yes, I actually studied to see which move is the worst. So by far, the worst move is obviously losing the bishop for free. That is not a good move. That is minus five for Black. Uh, the Bond Cloud, as much as Hikaru wins many games with it in his speedrun, is the worst move, the second worst move after Bishop A6 because the king is weak. And then G4. So G4 is a very bad move, weakening the king, weak dark squares. But F3 is very close. I don't understand F3. Uh, that is not what you're supposed to play in the opening. The knight is supposed to go there. Black responds very well. Knight C6, fantastic move. And now we begin to see the early goings of White's opening strategy, which is Queen E2... Uh, with the intention to have no strategy at all and basically just take it one move at a time. Queen e2 is a meaningless move. Um, it prepares absolutely nothing. Uh, the queen uh, now no longer defends the d-pawn, so the d-pawn can't go forward. You block your bishop on this diagonal. Uh, you sabotage your development even further and you will not be castling your king. Now, just so you all understand, a move like knight d4 here by black is actually not that good. And I talk about this in my video, 7 Most Common Chess Mistakes. One move attacking moves like this that do not guarantee you any material are not very good, especially if you, you help your opponent. So if like, for example, let's say queen d1 happens and then you just play like a passive move, suddenly you have helped your opponent expand their center. And now white is not even worse. So you have to be 100% certain that your move improves your position and doesn't just help your opponent. And black here plays a great move, d5. That's a wonderful move. I would like to see that move supported with a second knight. So d5, like get the second knight out and then put a knight in the middle. The reason I say that is that after d5, there really is no reason to put your queen in the middle of the board like this. Just like, you know, like how white is doing. Your queen's just going to be a target for a move like knight c3. At this point, uh, the player with white uh, already begins the blunders on move 5, which is really nothing short of impressive. I don't know if they've never consumed opening content, if they let their five-year-old child play that game who's never played a game of chess and just kind of wanted a little bit of screen time on the phone. I don't know. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, gotta get the kid, uh, kid a little bit of screen time in 2022. Uh, White here plays the move G4. So first and foremost, um, G4 almost hangs the pawn completely. Like, White is extremely lucky that this move doesn't just hang a pawn. It looks like it does, right? It looks like you cannot take because of this. But now Stockfish says, ah, I tricked you. Ha ha. Now you have to move your queen. And then I take the bishop for free. This can't be taken because it's well protected. Um, but g4 is just an atrocity. I mean, what are we even like? Come on. Um, at this point, what I'd like to see from black is development of the bishops or the knight. Uh, oh, not there. That was a misclick. I apologize. Uh, but, you know, bishop e6, knight f6, bishop c5, etc. Uh, black plays queen c5, so wasting a move with the queen. However, black's position is so good that it really makes no difference whatsoever. Actually, this move does have a threat, um, which black did not see. Uh, the idea is to go knight d4 and attack the queen in the pawn and then take c2. Now knight d4 actually is coming with a guarantee of winning material. White plays the move c3, completely accidentally stopping the stronger threat and mostly just seeing queen takes pawn. Also sabotaging the development of another knight. I mean, now the knights just can't move this to the middle whatsoever. Uh, again, I would really like to see development of the bishops or the knight, uh, but here, sometimes you get influenced by your opponent. Sometimes you see your opponent behaving like an ooga-booga chess player, and then you 
you just, you know, you go full Booga yourself, and you never want to do that. So now F6. I mean, F6 is not a blunder. It's, you know, again, Black's position is already so good, uh, but it, it, it's, not a, it's not a great move. And now, now White actually plays the most logical move already. Actually, White's most logical move is the move E4. Uh, White's second most logical move is B4. So B4 builds behind the C pawn and attacks the queen. Believe it or not, that actually can be taken. So knight takes b4, c before there is this move, and you're just picking up uh, the bishop on c1. Um, but of course, there is bishop a3, and then you have to find that you can unpin yourself with this move, knight c2. Uh, but yeah, b4 can absolutely be taken. That's why you always want to look for the most forcing moves first. Checks, captures, attacks. But queen d6, I don't hate it. And of course, white plays b5. It has now been eight moves, and white has only moved the queen and pawns. I mean, I don't know how this person made 800, but clearly something works. Black plays knight back to e7, and white plays the best move, bishop a3. All right, so now white is back in business, developing a piece with tempo, taking control, uh, queen e6. And now what white should do is catch up in development. All right, you can't move the knight, maybe move this, get this here, get this here, get this here. No, white takes the knight. I mean, it's like incredible. Like, it's just I attack the queen. Well, if I can't get the queen, then I'm going to get the second best thing. Folks, do not give up bishops for knights for no reason. The bishop is a better piece. It just is. Okay, it just is. It controls more squares on a board. It can see the entire board across, right? Like, if you don't have a good reason, like winning a pawn, damaging the pawn structure, winning material, checkmate, don't do this. There is no world in which that is a good move, all right? So queen takes e7 again. I would like to see development by black, but black, all right, black's not disappointing me just yet. Oh, but black will disappoint me. Bishop h3. So you see white developed the bishop in the same way on both sides. White is just a creature of habit. They like that side, that side. White has not moved a single knight, and it's going to be a long time until white moves a knight. It's going to be a very long time, okay? Black plays a6. Again, black has bishops, knight. I mean, but uh, black is playing to the level of the opponent, all right? So black plays the move a6. Now, a6, not a blunder. Like, so far, black's playing fine. But at some point, these inaccuracies are going to catch up to them, right? I would like to see development, castling. A6 is not a bad move. Of course, white sees it, so they take it, helping their opponent activate the rook. Uh, more often than not, this is not a, like, it's just not good to bring a rook out, like, to a random side square. But in this case, actually very reasonable, very reasonable move. Uh, but again, black needs to hide the king, so you're not going to hide the king this way, you got to hide it the other way. White plays g5. Okay, white is still continuing the strategy of moving uh, the pawns and the bishops and the queen. Uh, and now, every time a pawn moves, I want you to think what doors open, right? So the doors are now open, the bishops see each other. And let the fun begin as black absolutely bites the pawn and is now losing the game with the move bishop takes c8. Suddenly, the back rank has been infiltrated. The white bishop has entered on the c8 square, has captured material. White has a two-pawn material advantage, but it's, it's worse than that because you're going to probably lose this. The bishop will get back and attack the king, right? The bishop just has an escape path. And because black never took the time to develop any pieces, the second that you've made a mistake, now you, you're, you're stuck catching up on material and development. So what is the best move here by black? Probably guarding this. So rook over, maybe c6 to protect with the queen. Uh, what does black play? Rook a7. Rook a7 is fine. Rook b6, in my opinion, is slightly better. It's just kind of a little bit more, you know, rook a7 is fine, but you're targeting something protected. At least this way, you can still go on the sixth rank and you can go here. So you want to maintain as much flexibility as possible in the long run. White here finally brings in the queen. Now, that's not a good move at all because it can just be blocked. And I would urge you not to give checks, which can be very easily parried by enemy pawns, bishops and queens included. There's just no reason to do that. So c6 here guards this, um, but that doesn't happen. Uh, you don't have to move the king when you're in check. So king d8, and now these two pieces see this together. So of course, white plays the move. Bishop takes b7, and now has a four-point material advantage. Once this bishop goes here to prevent the king off the back rank, queen b8 will simply be mate. So white is two moves away from mate, and this is the way you need to think at all times. If I get two moves in a row, three moves in a row, how can I give mate? I got to weave the net, cover the escape square, right? So queen e6, actually not a bad move, preventing, uh, uh, well, not preventing bishop c6, but the king now has an escape. So bishop d5, queen d6, and I, if white here just played the move queen b8 and won the rook, I would have been so happy. Literally just look for checks. In every position, just look for a check. Maybe you're not going to play it, but find the check. c4, continuing to move pawns. The knights have now not moved in 18 moves. Knight f6, and now white sees it. Now white sees it. 
So white wanted to protect the bishop, I suppose. And now finds this here and here. Yeah. 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 Now, um, that part of it looks like a slip. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It kind of looks like a slip. That does not excuse the fact that in 20 moves of the game, white did not move 16 points of necessary material. You know what I mean? That does not excuse the fact that white did not move five of eight pieces on the back rank. I don't know what white's obsession is with queens, bishops, and pawns, but white does not respect the other forces. But now we are in for a game of chaos as black has a seven point material advantage. What do you do here with black? You use this. It's what you have. So you want to go here. You want to go here and here. You want to get down dirty. This is the, tr the square that traps everything, right? Attack the bishop, get to b2. What does black play? Oh, okay. Now black decides to develop a bishop. Where was that on move five? Where was bishop c5 on the fifth move of the game? Why did you spend the entire game doing God knows what? And once you win a queen, you don't even use it. You have the most powerful weapon in all of chess and you play bishop to e7. Knight c3 by white and then here, rather than getting the rook into the game or the queen into the game, black moves a pawn. Folks, you have to use what the chess gods bestowed upon you. All right, when the mouse gods intervene also and help, the, and help you and the chess gods, folks, you gotta use the queen, you have a queen. All right, how are you gonna buy a supercar and drive a Toyota? No disrespect to Toyota, pretty reasonable vehicle, but how are you gonna buy a supercar and not drive it? All right, I mean, I don't know, maybe you just like it in your garage. I don't, I'm from New York, we don't even know what garages are, all right? Uh, so G4, Knight b5, now we gotta move the queen, and the queen goes to b6. All right, great. Here, here white plays a move that if you, if you gave me uh, a month to study, I would not be able to explain the human condition to you. Like, I, I you know, uh, I, I wouldn't, you would probably have to perform some sort of brain surgery to find, like, what neurons fired. I don't understand what this bishop c8 move does. Like, white seemed to have a strong point with bishops this game. I don't know why white wouldn't just go here and at least just trade. Maybe white thought that, you know, they were just losing. So they decided I'm gonna go out with a bang, bishop c8. I don't get it. So they lose this. Now rook b1. Rook b1 is not a bad move, except for the fact that black is just overwhelmingly winning the game. Uh, there are no threats. So the same way you have to look for checks for yourself, you have to look for checks for your opponent. There really are no threats, the queen covers. I would either bring the rook or continue my plan here with chopping. Let's see what happens. Queen c6. So with the move queen c6, you attack the c4 pawn, right? However, what you now allow is literally the only thing that you had to not allow. There is one piece in this position past the middle line for your opponent, and you allowed it to fork your king and queen. Absolutely inexcusable. You have to see the checks and the attacks for your opponent. But furthermore, you have to see them when there is nothing left. This is what I urge all of you. There are no pieces left for your opponent. Make sure they can't do anything. That's it. That's all you gotta do. Just make sure they can't do anything. That's it. It's like getting hit by a parked car. All right? You're walking on the street. There are four cars parked. Don't walk into them. It's not that hard. They're right there. Pay attention. All right? Knight a7, and suddenly, white is back in the driver's seat, but it's the end game. And in the end game, the uh, ability of both players decreases by 50 to 100%. 99. You know, maybe one brain cell is remaining. Why? Because the end game is very, it's very strange. It's a very weird world. Like on the one hand, you want to say, well, white is winning here because white has a rook for a bishop. So obviously white has a major advantage. Not so fast. Not so fast. Rook versus bishop doesn't mean a whole lot. If your pieces work together very well, the relative value of your piece goes up. So white plays 92 and immediately gives back the advantage. Pawn takes pawn. And black, I mean, does not forget. G takes f3, sees it immediately. The knight is now hanging. So now white is only up one point of material. But why is white worse? Like, why is Stockfish saying that it's better for black? Well, Stockfish is saying it's better for black because these pawns are very strong. They're going to defend each other and be guarded like this. The king is actually very safe, believe it or not. Can't be attacked by much. And rook a8. And once this comes, white will now pressure this. If you try to protect this, Again, black's relative value is much stronger than white's. Because black controls all these squares, white cannot get a full piece into the game. 
By the time white is ready to bring the rook into the action, black will have swarmed the fort and will be creating unstoppable threats. Black is too active, as what we say in the endgame. Is that going to happen? No, of course not. Black is going to literally go backwards. <laughs> Why would you think that would ever happen? Folks, in the endgame, you got to coordinate your pieces together and go forward. All right, there's no... I mean, you can go back and then forward, but you can't just go back and leave the piece there, right? So, okay, knight e4, right? Now, now see, even here, computer, computer really likes knight c5. It actually really likes this trade to get a you know, bishop here or even a king up. Uh, a bishop to c5. Uh, okay, black gives check because, you know, you see check, you have to give it. And now this trade occurs. Uh, so, the endgame is fascinating. I mean, black has bishop and a pawn for a rook. Uh, white plays the move d3. Black plays the move f2. The reason why this endgame is actually so good uh, for black is because black's king is very active. So, for example, in like a worst case scenario for white, black's king would march all the way into e3. And then what ends up happening is you have to count the pawn majorities. Who has more pawns on which side of the board? White has a full going past pawn, but there is a rook there. But black has four pawns together, which is a nightmare. Because once they start teaming up and avalanching, you're not going to stop. They're just going to keep going one on top of the other. So, f2. Rook b5 check, allowing the king to fully infiltrate into the position. Although, uh, yeah, I mean, you have an option to go to no man's land, or you have an option to just go toward your pawn. And then, obviously, rook e5, there is this. There is also, by the way, this and this. You can completely ignore and just go get rid of the, the rook, but that's slightly too complicated. Uh, king goes to c3, giving back the advantage uh, to, uh, to white. a4, uh, trying to promote a pawn. c6, uh, trying to attack the rook. Now here you can take the pawn or go here. Uh, for some reason, uh, rook c5 is played. I, I don't understand why you would do that. Now king takes pawn is a free pawn, which black finds. So now... This pawn can just go. I mean, e4, e3, e2, that's just GG. What does white do? Well, white is completely sh shut down on the first rank. So white plays the move a5. And black here can win the game in two ways. March the pawn or find the only open file. Where is the only open file that black can claim? Rook b8. That's it. The game ends. Because rook b1 is unstoppable. Completely unstoppable. You would have to sacrifice your rook probably. If you try to go with your king... I check you, I bring you back, I find you, I bring you back, and I mate you here. Which is hard, that's hard to see, but you know what? You definitely don't want to play this, where are we going? Where are we going? Why are we chasing the rook? Why are we running away from this? The, the king is suppressing everything that white has to stand for, and then you run away to create a dummy attack on this rook, and you win the rook because the other person doesn't see it. Oh my god. How did you just leave the rook there? The rook can literally take both pawns. And you just, even if you do this, even if you can't even promote. I mean, like, what is, what is going on? This pawn was, oh, I'm gonna go make a queen. And you can't even do it. And then here it goes, it gets even worse. It gets even worse because white is like, oh, I can't promote. No problem. I'm going to sack my rook because he's going to take me and then I'm going to queen. But what about this? Oh, black actually does it. Black actually does it. Black could have just taken on F2 with the bishop. Oh, my goodness. You make your opponents look like geniuses. Black could have won two rooks in two moves. Literally, king c5. Rook f2, bishop f2, a 10-point giveaway in two moves. It's like we're on the Oprah show. It's insanity. Bishop f2 and black wins. Auto, auto win. Takes out the, oh my gosh. Instead of that, black plays rook takes f2. Do you know how much time black spent on the move rook takes f2? I will tell you right now. Four seconds. Black spent four seconds on rook takes f2 with four minutes on the clock. Oh my gosh, a8 queen, and now it's anybody's game. I mean, anybody can win this game. The thing is, when it's 0, 0, 0 like this, um, white needs to preserve a pawn. If white loses both pawns and black just, like, brings rook and bishop back, probably the game ends in perpetual check with best play, but we're not going to have best play, all right? Immediately, queen a4 check, king d3. And you're going to say, oh, free bishop. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely looks like it, except it's mate. I mean, it's not mate, but it looks like mate, and white would need to go here, boop, boop, and that's it. It's four on one in the endgame. Of course you win this. 
Black plays king e3. Black sees that the rook is hanging and defends it rather than moving it forward. Do you know how much time black spent on king e3? You want to know how much time black spent on king e3? Seven seconds. I mean, just rook f1. Just rook f1. Like, it's one square. It's, one, it's just, just rook f1. Like, what are we even doing? Just rook f1. Rook f1. Rook f1! Okay, king e3. Fine. Now white is completely winning because white is just obviously going to give a check. Take, take. Okay, what does white do? Okay, not exactly the right check. All right, king e1. No, why are you using the king? Same thing I said way back in the game. Use the piece you have. Why not take stuff? Okay, maybe you're low on time. Fine, it's excusable. Fine, queen f2. Oh my gosh. White hangs the queen. Black doesn't take it. You, you, what? Ah, what? You know how much time black spent on king d3? You wanna know how much time black spent on king d3? Four seconds. Oh man, I gotta guard my rook. What? Queen f3, take a pawn, do something. Okay, fine, h3, see, oh gosh, oh my gosh, black is gonna make a queen, isn't, oh, black's gonna make a queen. I don't know where white is pushing that pawn. I don't know where white thinks that pawn is going. And now rook c1. And unfortunately, folks, I have to tell you, there were absolutely no more plot twists in this game. The queen was lost, black promoted, came back, traded, and proceeded to very swiftly and very promptly deliver a final blow on move 69. Checkmate on the side of the board. And, um, well, what more is there to say?